next reading of Holy Scripture comes from Genesis chapter 2, 18 to 25. If you will stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. This is God's word. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may it be preached for you. You may be seated. And as we come to consider this portion of God's word, let us pray for his help. Almighty God, we come here this morning and need you to speak to us. We need you to um, remind us of truths. We need you to teach us in all truth. And as we consider this passage in its direct reflection upon marriage, we need you to help us understand our place within that, whatever our marital status may be. And, and we need you to show us how, how even understanding these things is valuable in understanding our relationship with you. Overcome the weaknesses of the preacher. They are so many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts that we might love you more, that we might serve you better. We ask it all in Christ's holy name. Amen. Marriage can evoke a a lot of different ideas for people. Some think of uh, the, think first at least of the wedding ceremony and that day of celebration and all of the festivities and events that go into that. Others think sort of more long-term, the implications and think about buying a house and buying a minivan and settling down and uh, so many other different ways you might come at it too in terms of first thought. But regardless of how we consider it, marriage is at rock bottom about communion. It is God's appointed institution for joining two people's lives together in the most intimate link between creatures. Now, we have been thinking in Genesis so far about how God created humanity in such a way as, we, as though we are, um, or so that, so that we are made for communion. And we've thought, firstly, about how we're made for communion with God. That is, in many ways, our, our 
you know, baseline purpose, our, our most fundamental reason for existence is that we might know communion with the God who made us. But we are also made that we need fellowship with one another. And that comes to the fore here in this closing section of, of Genesis 2. Now, we thought last time that we were in Genesis about uh, how this passage has a general aspect, how our need for fellowship with one another has a general aspect in that God's people need one another, broadly speaking. It's not good that we would be alone in a wide sense. We need other people. Further, though, well, this passage, this need for communion has a specific application in how our need for communion has a pointed expression in marriage. In Genesis 2, 18 to 25, Scripture highlights how God designed man and woman to be fit for marriage in order to address this need that man should not be alone. It's not good for, it was not good for him to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. And so the main point, the main point is that marriage is fellowship pointing to the communion we have with Christ. Marriage is fellowship pointing to the communion we have with Christ. And our three points to help us consider this are portraying communion, practicing communion, and prioritizing communion. So first, let's think about portraying communion. Uh, Although the creation narrative implies many truths about marriage, uh, it focused on how God appointed marriage primarily to address this need for communion, the issue of Adam not having proper, you know, most fitting communion with another creature. In Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Just as God had, as we have seen, had made a covenant relationship with Adam, well, now he created a partner for creaturely communion with Adam, and in this case, fit for the covenant of marriage. So there's, God, God is building this sort of formal relationships into, into his design for us because he covenanted with us, and now he's designing creatures fit for covenant with one another. Now, uh, strikingly, as we learn moving through this passage, Adam was not alone in the world in an absolute sense, right? God had, as, as we're reminded, had already made the animals, and, and Adam had some sort of relationship with them. They're, they're around. Uh, he has dominion over them. Um, and it is perhaps odd that God, or at least it might seem odd, you know, if, if, if we're not trying to, to grapple with what this might teach us at a deeper level, it might seem odd that God observed that it wasn't good for man to be alone, but then brought animals to him as if they could help solve that problem. But what's happening here is is the narrative is building suspense. God's word wants us to see uh, attention there. Suspense is building as we watch. I mean, God has assessed the situation. This This isn't good for him to be alone in this way. And then we get to watch Adam learn and learn with, with him, at least in terms of reading the story, right, that none of the animals were his suitable partner. There's still a need, right? The, the point was not just to tell Adam that he needed a fitting helper, but to show him that he needed a fitting helper and that this fitting helper did not yet exist. And we see why the animals were not fit partners for Adam uh, from the relationship that's, that's set before us between, between these animals and humanity in verses 19 to 20. Now, if we think back to the previous chapter uh, in Genesis 1:28, uh, God declared that Adam was to have dominion over the fish of the sea 
and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, naming something entailed authority over it. If you get to name it, you have authority over whatever you've just named. Right? And and that informs, you know, a lot of what we've seen in Genesis already. God has named the parts of the universe, right? Day and night, he gave them their names. Um, other things, that's just one example uh, throughout the, the creation week, right? He named the stuff that he made. And so we see he has authority over it, and he remains the supreme ruler, and which helps us understand why he brought the animals to Adam. He's really the one. He's the king over all the universe in the ultimate sense. And he is delegating Adam some authority within the structures of creation. And still, Adam imitated God as his image bearer, right? Uh, imitated God and God's, imitated God's authority. Not, he didn't usurp it here. Uh, but imitated as he should have God's authority by naming the animals. He exercised the authority that was delegated to him. And, and the problem was that as he had authority over all of these animals, he didn't have a proper helper for his task of bearing the divine image in covenant with God. He was flying solo, so to speak, in this, in this grand task that was given to humanity. And hence, we would read shortly after, why Adam rejoiced when God made Eve. Because, you know, this at last. I've looked at all the animals. I gave them their name. That's a lot of, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, there was probably dog um, and not all the different breeds of dogs. And still, yet, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of animals that he's just looked at and, and thought, none, none of these are really <laughs> what I need uh, for companionship in, in the highest sense. So, and, and so we get the force when we think of it that way. Uh, if you've just spent time thinking about what to call a goldfish, uh, this at last, this lady, this is good, is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This was the partner fit for creaturely communion with him in covenant. And he didn't have to look any longer. And the communion by covenant that God entered with humanity was meant to be mirrored, uh, reflected with an intimate relationship among creatures. This most intimate relationship between us and our God was meant to have um, something to illustrate it at the creaturely level. And so God formed two sexes, male and female, uh, to mirror the communion of God and his, and his image. God and humanity are, are different, and they are distinct. We are not God. Uh, we might have a correspondence, a resemblance to God as his image bearers, but we are distinct from him. There is a creator-creature distinction. Um, and, and so we have a fitting likeness in correspondence to God. And, and we have a, a most into, to, to reflect how that is supposed to fit together, our relationship with God. We have a most intimate communion between God and the creatures. And in like manner, man and woman are two distinct sexes. Right? And yet... They have a fitting likeness and correspondence to one another so that they can have the most intimate communion among creatures. If I, if I need to, to put a finer point on that, and maybe it's just worth doing it to do it, the immutable difference, the immutable difference between men and women reflects how humanity is different from God. And yet, within this difference that we cannot change, <laughs> we are meant for a wonderful relationship with God. 
And so, even though men and women are different, um, despite, I mean, yeah, despite what the world is telling us, right, that you can just swap these out, despite what the world is telling us, the, the difference points to how, well, things that are different can come together to have wonderful communion. Uh, marriage is the joining of two others, man and woman, who are not exactly alike, and yet can come together for most blessed relation. It is, and that is the fitting analogy of our relationship with God, in that God and humanity are immutably and fundamentally different and yet made for relationship. With a, well, we are made. He's not made. Um, and he made us for relationship with him. In that respect, marriage between man and woman, joined as distinct, different sexes in one communion, so a union of others, right, models how God, who is distinct and different from us, makes communion with us. It is vital to marriage that the parties, that the two people involved in it, be different from one another. Else it does not properly illustrate the communion with God that we have that, that marriage is meant to reflect. Uh, everything about humanity was crafted for communion with God, and marriage was designed for portraying communion with God. And that brings us to our second point. Second point. Practicing communion. Practicing communion. Marriage's significance uh, as, as meant to illustrate uh, our relationship with God is, is visible and valuable to everyone. I mean, that, that's one of the things I want to get out here. This, this, isn't, this sermon isn't just for people who are married, I hope. Um, uh, we all have things that we need to take away from this in God's word and the things that he has built into the world uh, are meant to help us all, right? And so the marriage's significance as, as something God has ordained to illustrate our relationship with him is visible and valuable to everyone as proper and healthy marriage should portray vital communion uh, like the one that we can have with God. So it should be an example. We, we struggle to do that. Um, but that, that's something that we can take up shortly later. And that makes the point of marriage, right? This isn't just practical lessons about how to make your marriage better, as if anyone was worried that I was going to be overly practical. Um, the, I know my weaknesses. Uh, that makes the point of marriage meaningful to everyone, uh, even if you are not married. Um, marriage's general value, marriage's general value uh, determines aspects of our sexual ethics. Right? I mean, first, in our passage, Adam and Eve were, as awkward as it makes us feel, naked and unashamed which is not my experience in any situation, right? But I'm not sure that uh, humanity holistically would never have made clothes if sin had not occurred. Um, since, I mean, if, if we think about the descriptions of, of the new creation, uh, we are to be dressed in fine white robes. Um, there are uses of clothing throughout Scripture to depict royalty and that sort of thing. Jesus will come back himself wearing robes to display his royalty. So um, it, it may not be that just if sin had never occurred, we would all always be... I mean, it seemed like there was weather, right? We would need clothes for, for weather purposes, at least. Anyway, um, <laughs> the point, though, seems to pull out of that tailspin. It seems that shameless, shameless nudity belonged by creation to the marital context. Uh, that's, that's where the shameless aspect belonged. Either way, we know that because of sin, Adam and Eve became ashamed, even when only the two of them were present. 
right? But marriage is that context. It, it is the one context where we should not be ashamed of our sexuality. Um, and that point, that point right there, suggests to us uh, why sex outside of marriage in all its different forms is sinful. The, the reason is grounded in our roles as God's image bearers and how God brought us forth from that um, intra-Trinitarian conversation, the conversation within the Trinity, right? The, um, as God said, let us make man in our own image. And, and so God conferred within Father, Son, and Spirit about what it meant to make humanity and the Ten Commandments then describe God's character as we've been considering in the evening services. And the Seventh Commandment forbids adultery because God is faithful to those whom he has made, with whom he has made formal communion, right? Those who don't belong to the Lord in Jesus Christ don't have his promises as their own. We have to belong to God in Jesus Christ to, to have the certainty of God coming through with the things he said he was done. Uh, God did not make communion um, with, with badgers or bears or fish. He covenanted with Adam and Eve. He spoke to them. And after the fall... God grants his communion, this intimate relationship, only to believers and not to those who do not belong to his people. And so as God's image bearers, we, we grant the most, to reflect this, right? Because, because God has, has granted communion uh, with us with specific reasons and within specific commitments. And so we grant the most intimate of communion, the, the, the consummation of the marital relationship, right? Only within the formal covenant of marriage as well. Second, I, mean, I, I, hope, well, I, I hope that first thing helps. Um, the reason I have belabored that is because we need good explanations that, that can make sense to everyone around us why, why we hold what we hold about our sexual ethics. Um, you know, God's Word teaches us this, and so it comes with the authority of Scripture, and yet God's Word is telling us about purposes you know, with why he's made us. These are things that God imbued into creation itself, reasons that are God-given but, but inherent in creation. It's not just that it could have been any, any way, one way or the other, and God decided don't have sex outside of, uh, of marriage. You know, this, this, is, this corresponds to how we're made. And I think that all of us need a, a deeper appreciation of that so that we're more well prepared for how to answer things that are very pointed and hard to, um, maybe hard isn't the right word, um, challenges that will come to you repeatedly with intensity. I hope that that's, that first thing is helpful in that regard. Second, Second, how, how does marriage help us all? We, we saw last time that we were in Genesis um, how that communion of, of God's uh, intra-Trinitarian conversation, let us make man in our own image, brought forth a creature fit for communion with God and fit for creaturely communion. And so God's self-deliberation, how he talked to himself so to speak, um, of within this communion within the Trinity in order to create humanity. Well, that makes clear that, that this sort of communion is the setting for reproduction, right? Our triune God confers communally about creating humanity in the divine image, 
which, which signals that communion and replication, reproduction of sorts, uh, and those joined together are marks of God's character. Um, because God is Trinity, because God is triune, communion is part of what it means to be God. Father, Son, and Spirit have communion by essence with one another. And so too, it should belong to what it means, communion should belong to what it means to be God's image bearers. And so God's image bearers reproduce and, and use sexual intimacy that results in reproduction only within the confines of special communion in marriage. And, and important considerations also apply directly uh, for, for married people, right? So this is, you know, so far we've been kind of thinking about, well, this is why, uh, this is why uh, our sexual ethics are what they are. Uh, and now we can, we can think about how that's, well, that's not just an application for wait till you're married. There's, there's further things that if we are married, we, ha- we have implications here. Most pointedly, if marriage is meant to portray the communion that we have with God, well then, are we conducting our marriages in ways that demonstrate lives of communion together? Sometimes we turn our marriages in, into contracts where, where we get what we want from the relationship at, at the expense of the other person. Christians shouldn't be that way in marriage. No one should be that way. But we most of all, we most of all should not be that way in marriage. We should not be negligent, absent, overbearing, nagging. Fill out the rest of the list. We shouldn't focus on our our own interest, what I can get, what I deserve from you. Um, But we ought all in our marriages focus on what should I do to ferment communion? Make it, make it stronger. Right? Give it, I mean, ferment. I chose ferment on purpose. Um, give it more bite, right, as it sits. So, in this light, God formed the woman from the man's rib to be Adam's fitting uh, partner in covenant. Matthew Henry, famous uh, 17th century commentator, uh, famously noted, uh, not made out of his head to top him, not made out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arm to be protected, and near to his heart to be beloved. Might we sit with that to think about how we live in our families? In this way, um, the text says, very interestingly says, that God made a, a helper for man. Now, we, I think we rush to, to load our own, um, you know, assumptions into helper. Well, Adam's doing it, but, you know, he, he needs a little bit of extra support. And so this is, much, and that's not what's going on here. Helper signifies how the woman would make an essential and a needed contribution to the man's life. It is not about inferiority or inadequacy in any sense. Uh, an essential and needed contribution. And now, here, here's, here's why 
I think that that is part of what's going on here. 16 of, out of 19 uses. So, so the word helper in the Old Testament, right? 16 out of 19 times that the word helper appears in the Old Testament, uh, it refers to God in relation to us. God is our helper. Um, further, John 14 calls the Holy Spirit our helper. And certainly, certainly God is not inferior to us. We are not superior to God. And yet God is our helper. And so helper does not uh, denote inferiority, inadequacy, inadequacy, deficiency. But no, it, it denotes something that is so crucially needed in as much as the illustration given to us by Scripture is that God is the helper to all of us. More, more pointedly for how we conduct our marriages, uh, Adam does something very striking uh, upon meeting his wife. In, in verse 23, he has this exclamation, his rejoicing, right? This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Uh, and then pertinent for where, where we are here, she shall be called woman because she was taken, taken out of man. Now, one of the things going on here that isn't plain in, in an English translation is uh, the text just switched words for man. It's a different Hebrew word behind this appearance of man here. The, the Hebrew uh, word here is different. And Adam, so I mean the word Adam is a Hebrew word. We just bring it over. Uh, and it means, it's a proper name for this individual. Uh, it also can refer just to man as in mankind. Um, and so throughout Genesis so far, we've seen man referred to as Adam, Adam, and God brought Adam from the ground. Okay, we, we saw that earlier in Genesis 2. And the Hebrew, I don't like doing the language stuff, but here's where, here's where it makes a point. Okay, the Hebrew word for ground is Adamah. So you've got Adam coming from Adamah. The man comes from the ground. Uh, and since Adam was a gardener, He's put in a garden, meant to work the earth, right? The narrative has been naming Adam in relation to his job, the ground. Um, but now Adam switches terms, and, and he names himself in relation to his wife. Um, the man, Hebrew-ish, right, in relation to the woman, Isha, in Hebrew. Um, yeah, this might be most pointedly for me. Husbands, how often do we invert that relationship by defining ourselves by our work rather than our relationship with our wife? Do you, do you think of yourself foremost by connection to the task God has given you or by the communion God has granted you in marriage? Well, we see what Scripture would have for us here when we realize the gift that is before us. We ought to name ourselves by the communion we have with this special covenant partner. And we should all remember, we should all remember that we easily let our relationships focus on the jobs we have, the house where we live, the activities in which we engage, the way that we do this and that. There are many distractions that can invade our marriages and all of our relationships. And we must remember that marriage is about communion. Just because work is draining does not mean that our time at home is for tuning out and vegging on television. That is not a worthwhile investment of our time. Um, 
It do, it, marriage is for communion. And so it, do, it is not the case that we've ever done our part. You know, I can tick the box to fulfill my part of the relationship. There is no tick box as if we are done. It keeps going. Marriage is about communion, and we have to live like it. Practicing communion means involving our full selves continually in the relationship of marriage. And that brings us to our final point, um, prioritizing communion. Um, verse 24 makes a, makes a programmatic statement um, about marriage based on the fittingness of the woman for the man. Um, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And as we've considered, it is in light of this bond that they were naked and unashamed. More fundamentally, this verse shows us that actually our marriages take precedent over pre, you know, previously standing biological family relationships. Although certainly we ought to maintain a, a loving commitment to our, our parents uh, relatives of, of any sort, you know. Marriage does relocate us from a primary connection to those relationships into a priority on the marital relationship. Um, if, if you are asked to choose between your husband or wife and any other member of your family, it ought to take you no time at all to decide. That's the point. It, it's instant. It's been decided in the moment that you became married. Godly parents uh, will remain, godly parents will remain continual founts of wisdom, right? And, and we, have to, we should respect that and be glad for that. But we shouldn't allow our biological links to create divisions within our marriages or have any dominance over it. And the same goes uh, for children as well, which is, was, is perhaps one that's harder to be on guard for. We love our children, undoubtedly, and, and can be, you know, wrapped within that. But, but your marriage is the bedrock of your family. A married couple is, is in fact, a family apart from when they have children, if they have children. And, and so children need to see the strength of that foundation as a, as a priority in any family. This is, this is why, this is why every week on our prayer list, we have that continual line item that we would pray that our families would be faithful as to show the world the value of the family unit. This is part of what we're praying for as we ask that every week, right? That, that we would even show our children, those in our families, the value of this, this foundational aspect to the family. Just like our identity is shaped by uh, marital, marital communion over our work, it should be shaped by marriage over and before our role, even as parents. And the theological reason for this priority on marriage is because Scripture plainly states, as we read in Ephesians 5, that marriage depicts the relationship between Christ and his church. Just like marriage relocates you from the primary link to your biological family into that covenantal bond, so too faith in Christ relocates you from a natural link to the world into a covenantal bond with the Savior. Marriage takes two people who were once separate and joins them together in communion by covenant. And hence, 
as we were once separate from Christ, but are now made one with Him. Our union with Christ is the most blessed reality that we can know. Christ is the faithful husband to His church who came and died for every sin of every believer so that He might cleanse us and make us blameless, so to present us at the last day at His return when we will have that that blessed wedding feast of the Lamb and celebrate the the consummate communion of Christ and His people. It's easy to see how we are so often unfaithful to Him, preferring the uh, allures of the world and the lusts of the flesh. And we are glad as we reckon with our weaknesses to know that Christ is the husband who will never abandon us. He has joined himself to us by faith so that we will always be his. And it cannot be changed. It is not good for man to be alone. And so marriage is good. But marriage to Christ is best. Regardless of your regardless of your earthly marital status. In Christ, we are never alone. And his promise and he has promised us that that will be the case forever. And we have the very communion for which we were created union with our God. As Adam leaped for joy to claim Eve as his bride, Hebrews tells us that Christ, for the joy set before him, endured the cross to claim us as his bride. The depth of communion that we see in faithful marriages was forged into creation in order to point us to the communion we have with God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every joy that is displayed for us all in marriage, as hard as it is to fathom, as hard as it might be to fathom, is dwarfed by the overwhelming love and communion that we have with our Maker because of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, how glad we are to belong to Christ. And might that joy help us to understand why it's good to belong to one another. Help us all, wherever we might be, whether married or single, um, to grow in our appreciation for what it means to be the bride of Christ. Help us, we ask, that that might shape how we live. Give us, give us strength and endurance. Help it to shape even how we, all of us together, might relate to one another. As this need for one another, to some degree, as an ex- in, uh, in marriage, is an expression, a more specific expression of the general way in which we need one another. And so as the people of God, might we learn to treasure each other as brothers and sisters as we look at one another knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ died to redeem us all. We ask it in his name for his sake. Amen.